Thank you very much, all three speakers, for very thoughtful, uh, provocative uh, introduction to the topic. And now it's the opportunity to pass this over to the audience. We have somebody I see with a the microphone there. Is it necessary that the questions go into the microphone? Just the oh, just to the themselves. speakers? Okay. Um, so the floor is open. I really look forward to people's questions. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Brian Vincent with Stop UBC Animal Research. And the question I have is that UBC is so proud of its animal research and believes it's so effective. Why does the university refuse continually to provide information to Stop UBC Animal Research in response to our numerous Freedom of Information Act requests? Uh, many of you may know that on Monday, UBC was actually ordered by the BC Office of Information Privacy Commissioner to release certain details which they refused to do. We have asked for video footage and photographs of experiments, lab inspection reports, data by species, vet necropsy reports, those sorts of things. Doesn't the public have a right to know, since it's taxpayer funded, what UBC is doing to animals with that money? Thank you. Uh, can I, Bill, are you willing to take a step of that? I can certainly give my personal opinion, which is not necessarily UBC's, but uh, speaking as a UBC researcher, one of the things that one has to keep in mind is that a lot of the information um, associated with animal research is not disclosed for good reason. Uh, some of it is proprietary. Uh, releasing the information would either undermine intellectual property or could even jeopardize the research itself. On the other hand, a lot of that information could be released. The challenge that we face is determining which falls into which category, and then, uh, based on that, releasing the information. UBC has actually been extremely proactive in trying to address this. There's no doubt that in the past, the route that was taken was to protect the interests of the researchers and to release as little as possible. Um, it's acknowledged that much of that information can be released. And what has happened in the last um, months with the uh, Commissioner's Office and Freedom of Information Act was to ask the Commissioner to determine in their views, which of this, which information could be released without it compromising intellectual property or undermining research process, and which could not. And so the rulings that came down from the commissioner's office earlier this week simply um, is a decision, a preliminary decision about which records fall under the scope of freedom of information and which don't. Now that that's been released, the university can move forward and begin to make available that information which uh, has been ruled as, as free to, di to distribute. I think one of the things that, that everybody has to realize is that most researchers at UBC are proud of what they do and more than happy to tell the public about it. And in fact, they do. All the research that they do ultimately is published and in public domain. So there is no attempt by researchers to hide what they do, how they do it, or what the consequences of the research are. We're all proud of what we do. We want the public to know what we do. The, the checks and balances that have been put in place have been put there to protect, as I say, proprietary interests and to protect the research enterprise itself. What we, and again, the uh, move towards more transparency, which I think you will acknowledge, we're making slow steps and slow progress, but there is a move in that direction, but that has been proactively initiated from within the UBC research community. The researchers want to address this problem too. We would love to make more information freely available, and we're going through the process of, of in a academic and scholarly fashion, determining the best way to do, what can be released and the best way to do it. Thank you, Bill. Can I add to this? Very briefly. Very yeah. briefly. I want to make sure there's lots of time for other questions. So, you know, the, the current success rate in uh, uh, scientific grants, uh, federally funded ones, so taxpayer funded ones, there's plenty of research that is charity funded here, so ch funded by association of patients that quite honestly 
uh, somehow tend to think that uh, uh, their situation is more dire than the ones of the animals. But the CHR grants uh, success rate is right now around 16%. That means that out of 100 people that applies for a grant, 16 get it. It's pretty much a you know, dog eat dog word out there. And uh, despite the fact that this is a position that I completely disagree with, a lot of scientists out there feel more safe if their competitors that are going to go in for the same pot of money don't know what they are doing before the time that they are ready to divulge it. Now, if UBC were to reveal all the information that they are asked for in terms of animal protocols, they would uh, necessarily enable their competitors to figure out what they are doing. And this is a big issue. Personally, I tell people, the worldwide community, what I do the whole time. I don't care. I do this job for fun, not because of, you know, I want to have a bigger lab or something. But I can understand that there are fields in which it's cutthroat out there. And it's wrong. Don't get me, you know, we could have a whole symposium series on peer review and funding uh, research and how uh, the whole system is distorted by certain mechanisms. But unfortunately, the fact is that those mechanisms are there, and those mechanisms will, uh, at this time, interfere with the release of all information. Thank you very much. Lots of hands there. Uh, why don't we start right at the very back? This is a question that um, is mainly for Dr. Milson, but if any of the other panelists want to jump in, you're welcome. Um, the Canadian Council on Animal Care has a mandate to um, monitor animal research in Canada according to the interests of Canadians. And so I wonder, from your experience, both at the Animal Care Committee level and at the CCAC level, um, the, the, there's, there's a, a relatively small amount of, of non-scientist participation in, in that governance structure. And um, it means there's a lot of weight on the shoulders of the, the few number of individuals who have to play that role. And, and in your mind, from your experience, what, what do you see could be done to um, expand civic engagement to more adequately address the true and incorporate the true um, uh, perspectives of Canadians into deliberating on these tough issues? Thank you very much, Jeff. I'll just say that you were also setting up very beautifully uh, a subsequent session in the series. So I'll just ask our speakers to answer that briefly, but to tempt the entire audience to, to come along at our, our next sessions. I think Dan's right. There will be almost an entire session on that. The, but let me get it clear. Do you mean with regard to the functioning of CCAC and animal care committees in general, or specifically to inspections? To either. Uh, so one of the big questions in addressing that in general, and it comes back to Brian's question as well, and that is to what extent should protocols and protocol review be in the public domain rather than um, by an animal care committee with a small representation of the general public on it? And that is something that certainly many of us are, are uh, concerned about and very interested to try to come up with a solution that we think uh, will work for Canada. I think people know that around the world right now there's a tremendous difference in how things are handled. The British system is very wide open. Uh, Sweden has its own system. Switzerland, Australia, there are a variety of them. One of the things we'd like to do is to uh, bring folks together from all those com countries to talk about the pros and cons of the system they have in place and to try to come up with what we feel uh, would work here at UBC and what would work across Canada. There'd have to be buy-in across the whole country for it to, to work and work effectively, but it's something that we're working towards. So how much public engagement? Should it be wide open? Uh, should it be a representative on a committee? Should it be more? It's an extremely good question. My own opinion is that I, I would like to see it much wider open than it currently is. Um, we'll see. The session will be a good one. I'll certainly be here. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, so my name is Elon Cohen, and my question is, it seems to me that the guiding framework that I see on the panel so far is seeing animals as species. And so the language of seeing, you know, 
harming a certain portion of the species, and this is especially in the language of endangered species, harming a certain portion of the species to save the other majority of the species, it becomes very different when we think of animals as individuals. Because all of a sudden, killing an individual is very different from killing a portion of the species. But the question that I have um, actually comes out of a phrase that, that you used, Bill. You said that if it wasn't for all of the research that we've done, there will be pets, and I quote, pets that had to be destroyed. This is a funny way of phrasing it, because when I think of my companion species, I wouldn't think of somebody destroying him, but rather killing him. And I think that language is important there. And so my question is, is about what does it mean to responsibly kill someone or some being? Because what I haven't heard in the panel so far, and this, I'm glad that Nelly uh, definitely addressed this, but what I haven't heard from Fabio or you, Bill, is what are the limits to where we actually draw the line? And I'm glad that uh, the Nazi experimentation was brought up, so clearly there are moral and ethical limits we draw up. But is it the case, like Fabio said, that we just kind of push forward in this discourse of progress? We just keep going and going until we solve it? Or the flip side of my question is, shouldn't we learn what it means to die? Shouldn't we actually think about what it means to live a full life and at some point say enough is enough? There are certain responsible lines we don't want to cross. Thank you. That's so that's for both Fabio and Bill. Why don't we get Fabio for shot at? I would. That, I actually I completely agree with you. And uh, I must point out that the goal of our research is not to keep people alive for 200 years. From a purely biological standpoint, once you've had your kids, you're useless. <laughs> well, that's what it boils down to. The point is to keep people alive as they normally would be alive, as long as they normally would be alive for, and keep them alive relatively in a, in a state of lack of suffering. Right? Now, that is the goal, is not to extend life, and I completely agree with you that, uh, you know, there are branches of research that are just odd in their goals, like uh, aging research. A lot of people think that aging research means let's get people to live longer. That's not what it means. It means let's get people to live better for the same length of time, right? So, the, you know, I don't think that... Um, the killing issue is actually very interesting because, uh, you know, we, we, this proves that uh, uh, ethically animals and people are very different, right? Because when an animal is suffering, what do you do? What do you have to do, I would say, according to regulation? There are very strict boundaries to the limits that of suffering of an animal that don't exist anywhere but in universities, uh, research. Um, what you have to kill it, euthanize it, we call it, give it a sweet death, all right? Try to do that with a human, and then we'll see uh, what ethical issues you raise. You know, how do you address uh, the, uh, the increasing population in stray dogs? You castrate them. You want to try it with the homeless? <laughs> so there are very different boundaries for humans and animals, but the fact that we all need to learn how to die is absolutely correct. And the question is, we need to die sweetly, both humans and animals. And that's where research is going, is not in avoiding the death. Thank you. Do either of you, you want to take a shot about Nelly or Bill? Uh, well, uh, I'll address two parts of that. I mean, the terminology. So destroy is a harsh word. But I mean it more so in terms of uh, responsibility and agency. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to be very different who we kill mm -hmm. and something that is destroyed. It's, just, it's an odd uh, language to use. I don't think of somebody destroying the pet. Right. right. Well, and perhaps one of the reasons for using that term is because I agree with you in saying destroy rather than kill or sacrifice or something that's gentler points out that it is going to lead to the death of an animal. The, are there limits? There certainly are. And those limits are, there are established, and that's the role of animal care committees in the CCAC, is to ensure that those limits are followed. When I was reading about human experimentation, the one huge insurmountable difference other than lack of consent was that you don't do experiments on humans that will likely lead to their deaths ever. I mean, you couldn't. But with animals, unfortunately, it's very common. Thank you. Uh, why don't we go ahead and back? Um, I don't, this isn't 
directed to anybody in particular, and I'm not even really sure that it's a question that can be answered very clearly right now, but I'm just thinking how, yeah, so, I mean, you can kill an animal, test on an animal, and it can help a lot of people. And so I get that logic, but, uh, so, I mean, what is it? I mean, it would help a lot of people, too, if you went and found some millionaire and killed that guy and stole all his money, right? Or, like, used another human to uh, test for some, for some reason or another. But we don't, because we offer other humans a certain moral status where that's not okay. So if <coughs> other animals are similar enough to us that we can test on them and learn about ourselves and learn how to help ourselves, why don't we offer them a similar moral status? What makes it okay to do that? Excellent question. So just the, the, what I'm are the limits I'm hard to, of hearing, <laughs> so I don't get it. Just in a condensed form, what are the limits to utilitarian reasoning? Is it, is it okay to do anything to an animal for our benefit? There are limits in some other cases. She pointed out, for example, there's we're, we don't consider permissible to cause a serious harm to another human, even though it may benefit other people. So it's a, it's a moral challenge. So I'll leave that to any of our panelists that are uh, willing to take that one on. I have a question for you. So you think that the guys that killed Osama bin Laden were committing ethical or unethical fact? Because, you know, the, the other humans get killed the whole time for the benefit of larger amounts of the uh, larger numbers of the society. And we can pretend that it doesn't happen, but it does happen. And I just want you to keep it in mind because there's a lot of cosmetics in the way that we behave and we think that when you boil it down, it really it turns out it's not that different the way we treat humans and animals. And, but I would argue that the, the, um, I've made a couple of examples of very different outlooks from an ethical standpoint between humans and animals. And I have some, a thought that I would like to offer and that I know is going to be controversial, but I would say that the difference the, in the ethical standing between humans and animals is caused by evolution itself. We can go on forever on this topic, perhaps later. Do any, uh, the I only other ask. thing that I'd add to it is that now from the perspective of a biologist is to keep in mind that most biologists, well, I'll speak for myself, hold animal life in much higher regard than human. Well, I mean, I oh, think, I think <laughs> human life is, humans are animals, so I'm just thinking... Yeah, and not a very good species either. <laughs> but let's say that many animals are much nicer than humans. Yeah, that's I mean, what's no. the, no doubt about that. The intelligence comes, the, 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 the intelligence comes with the capacity for cruelty and uh, exploitation, but it also comes with the capacity for compassion. And uh, so it's, yeah, it's just a question. Thank you very much. Uh, question in the back one. We start the very far back one. Thank you. Uh, Nellie, I'll stand just so that you are able to hear me. Uh, you mentioned that with animals, we use animals for food, for shoes, physical labor, entertainment, etc. However, there is a portion of the population that doesn't do that. They live a vegan lifestyle, they live a gentle lifestyle. They do not agree with using animals. In uh, hunting and fishing, for example, countries are beginning to develop ecotourism. Instead of using animals, they're sharing animals. They're benefiting still economically, but to no one's detriment or harm. I agree that people that hunt and fish for amusement, they should be put on the end of a hook, as I also agree that the students, the professors, people that use animals in research should put themselves in the cage and see how it feels. You exercise your choice not to go there. The animals don't have that right. They don't have that choice. I do have a question for you, please. And UBC, through Stop UBC Animal Research, we tried to uh, secure the release of the sea turtles that were being tested on. Last year, UBC agreed to spare their lives and moved the turtles to a facility that we were able to find in the United Kingdom. I'd like to know if those animals, if those sea turtles were moved, and if UBC says they were, where can we find the proof of that move? Thank you. Great question. I don't know if, if anybody knows that's a technical question. Does anybody know the answer to that? 
if that's in the right. So the, the sea turtles mm -hmm. have gone to other homes. They have not gone to the United Kingdom. Can you tell us where they went then, please? Um, we have a right to know. No, you certainly do. So just to, uh, just to come to you, so Bill is here as yeah. a scientist. He's not here representing mm -hmm. the university. And so okay. I don't could want to put someone, you in a position where you start getting in trouble with your bosses. No, and but so, could someone report back to us yeah. where they went? And I have one tiny comment after that. Well, what I'll say right now is they're in limbo. Homes have been found and are not for all of them. So homes have been found for most of them. Uh, are, we're in the final processes, final process of securing homes for the rest of them. And the, right now, it's all in Canada. And what will happen to any that you don't find homes for? Oh, homes have been found. It's a matter of the paperwork. Are they going on to further research homes? No. Okay. Well, they are in the sense that public display is educational research. All depends on how you want to define research. Yes, and in fact, the monkeys that were just used in the Parkinson, where four of them were destroyed, due to the damage that was done to the monkeys, and that's in the report. What's happened with the others? There's 10 others, I believe. That I can't okay. speak to. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, gonna to limit you okay. to, you can ask, I'll give you another second. <laughs> I just wanted to say, when you mentioned that the Germans tested on humans, um, the Nazis, please, the okay. Germans. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, the Nazis tested on the humans. I believe until we respect all life forms, be they humans or animals, we're not going to um, we're not going to end testing on animals because factory farming is acceptable. Testing on animals is acceptable. We need to respect life, and then it will. But what, what would you do instead? I would be <clears throat> absolutely delighted if we stopped animal research. There's but others. what? There is no substitute. <laughs> Do you just let illnesses go on and problems go on? And go ahead. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm not really posing this to. Sorry, I'm not posing it to the three of you. I'm posing it to pretty much everyone. I want everyone here to put up their hand who's never taken an aspirin. It's aspirin. No, I mean, okay. Be fair here. How many of you have watched a family member die of cancer, or MS, Parkinson's disease? Would any of you have tried to stop that if you could? Yes. Okay. Well, May I'm I not. Let me. No, let me finish. Oh, no, as I, I think I do want oh, to so say Sorry, sorry. Thing. No, but let Because you're sorry. asking a question. No, sorry, I'm, no, I'm sorry. I'll just ask. Oh, you just, I'll just, just, just for a second. Please, sorry. I'll I know everybody after. is, is <laughs> really just, interested and passionate about it. Just give me one second to finish off. So I just asked people just for respect and to keep it going smoothly is please direct your questions through the moderator. Thank you. Okay. So, so and my point, my point is I would rather animals not be tested on. And I hope one day we can get to that point. And until we get to that point, we have to work towards finding better ways, like you are. But until then we can't stop all research. Because Every dr new drug that comes on the market, every person who gets a disease that uses that new drug. And people can sit here and, and, and argue that point. But I have Parkinson's disease. And I will die of Parkinson's disease. And every drug I will take, every surgery that I may have, will have directly resulted from animal <coughs> research. Does that hurt me? Yes. Do I every day pray for those animals? Yes. But at the end of the day, should everyone who has a disease suffer while we wait to find better ways? Thank That's you for, for your provocative comments. I will ask for people to, if they can, try their best to phrase a comment in terms of a question. Can I just uh, you, uh, give her a very briefly. Yes. Yes, I just wanted to give a different perspective because the former speaker's a comment made an assumption in the tone. My father has Parkinson's. Seeing how he suffered from it, I wouldn't wish that upon any living being, the monkey or otherwise. No. Um, so I, I, I take exception. You know, I have a problem with your with the tone. 
of the form of the previous speaker. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, you. Um, I just want to start just by clarifying the use of the word can't, because it's been thrown around in several different ways. Um, in some uses, it's used as a scientific sense. You can't get these kinds of results unless we experiment on animals. In other cases, it's been used in an ethical sense. We can't get these results unless we experiment on animals. Sometimes it's scientific, and I'm sure you're the best place to speak to, to that question. But the ethical question is really, um, what are the alternatives? I mean, if the question is, you know, can we get the same results or better results on, on humans? Uh, and presumably, generally speaking, if we could do the experiments on humans in the ethical sense, then we could get better direct and immediate results than doing them on animals. So in that sense, it's not true that we can't get the results without doing them on non-human animals. I, generally, I take that to be the case. So the, the question would draw the question specifically to the ethical question. If we can do it on animals and we can't do it on humans, what's the moral justification for saying the humans matter more than the non-human animals? You mentioned the evolution, for example. But as you well know, Darwin said it's simply a matter of degree, not a matter of kind. Any, aspect, any difference between us and us is not a matter of kind. So my question is to, to the panel, how do you ethically come to the conclusion, which I take is implicit in your views, that human beings matter more than non-human animals? Can I answer this? Just as, as uh, relates to my comment on evolution, what right does a snake to eat a mouse? I well, mean, say an animal, uh, a snake what? needs to eat a mouse in order to live, human beings don't. Well, it, it, now they don't, they have throughout evolution. And this is what I meant. This is a situation that has been created through evolution because humans have needed animals for Even most of their history. Passes. And me, we may be able to change it, but what the point I'm trying to make is we're not quite there yet. We still need them for certain things. Right? That just wanted to clarify what I meant when I said evolution. Thank you. Either the other panelists want to... Uh, the, 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 the issue is, where do we draw the line? So there, there, there's, well, there seems to be an argument about when we say that uh, certain types of research procedures would not be acceptable in humans, if we want to have the finding, we need to apply them in animals. Inherent in that logic is that the animal's life is somehow less worthy than the human's. Mm -hmm. And so the, it, hopefully not mischaracterizing the argument. And, and so he's just looking for some justification for where do we draw the line there? And how do we draw that line? Why is the mouse life less worthy than the You've had your chance, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> From the other speaker. <laughs> if either you'd like. A very hard question. It's a hard question, a hard question. because, uh, you know, yeah. I think everybody agreed that doing the syphilis experiments on humans is terrible, but doing the same thing in mice would probably be acceptable. And is that right? No, but it's, it's still the case. And I use animals or used before I retired from I my mean, experiments because I wanted to help I mean, the people how with cancer. How should we act? But, uh, and I guess I'll choose my words carefully, but speaking as a biologist, I don't hold human life that much more valuable than other. It, life is life. But you still you use position. animals. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> sorry. So. Then I remain puzzled by your position. But there are, however, just, just sorry, Fab, we'll take okay. it one at a time. Yeah. So my position is, again, biologists study animals, not for human health, but for animal health and for global health. But you're still killing the animals in the process. Now, yes. those animals that are dead, did they deserve to die just so some cow will be healthy? That, that, <laughs> that wasn't the question. The question. Yeah. It's a good <laughs> question Sorry. to get off. So thank you very much. Um, Somebody asked that one, I'll answer. <laughs> I saw a question on the side. I, I, I think I'm after. Oh, OK. OK, go for it. Yeah. So I have a little example of these comments that are going on about how, well, obviously animals benefit from our research, and you know every veterinarian will tell you that because I actually, well, I'm a homeopathic veterinarian. I mean, I'm conventionally trained, but I see far more benefits in my patients' health from proper nutrition, proper lifestyle, proper care, 
than I do from vaccinations, which I think we cause more harm than good with how much we vaccinate. From, I barely ever use antibiotics personally, but yeah, sometimes it helps. But I don't recommend chemo because I think it causes more suffering to the animals than it alleviates. So I'll just, and when I was in vet school, I saw a lot of unnecessary animal use in learning surgery and that kind of thing. So, so I think that this is, that was whitewashed a little bit. I also have had some experience doing some research in zoology, so I'm curious, my question is more about that. I'm curious why no one really mentioned when this research actually has a detrimental effect, both on humans and animals, or maybe even is unnecessary or diverts attention. For example, in zoology, I participated on a project where we um, did radio tracking of the blue racer snake on Pele Island. And it was a great project, and we, we probably did kill one snake, but mostly did not harm the snakes with implanting the radio transmitters. But I felt like it was taking the attention away from what the point was, which was to preserve their habitat. Mm -hmm. So while we're finding out all this information about the snakes, the habitat continued to be destroyed. And it, I, I don't think that's an isolated case. So I'm just curious about how much knowledge we need to know while habitat's being destroyed. Well, Thank you. Uh, well, the answer that I would give, I think, addresses both components of it, in that while it's very true that not only with animal health but human health, a lot can be addressed by better nutrition, better lifestyle, and a whole slew of other things, those aren't going to help you in the case of traumatic injury. You still have to know how to fix it. Again, there's no doubt that in terms of conservation issues, stopping the degradation of the environment is the key thing that has to happen. But in the process, to try to preserve diversity and preserve animal life, there are things we can do. And doing those are based on our knowledge, which comes from that research. So yes, it's a difference between treating the disease and treating the symptoms in both cases. Can I, I really like the first part of your question too, actually. So I'll just be a bit disruptive to the panel <laughs> and, and ask you, because it seems to me part of what you're saying there is there's sometimes claims about benefits without necessarily showing us the data for the benefits. Am I saying it right? Sure. Yeah. So just, you know, I, I don't know if anybody would like to respond to that, but how, I guess I'm asking is how do we, how, what do you think is, is adequate in terms of documentation of benefits? And does that happen often enough? Over which time frame? You can answer you know, like. <laughs> no, I, I alluded it, I alluded to it in yeah. my opening comments, and that is, again, an awful lot of research falls in the domain of basic discovery research rather than applied. The connections between applied research and benefits are much easier to show. Um, you're trying to apply something, and either it works or it doesn't work, and you can you can show what those benefits are. Discovery research, as I say, by its nature, knowledge for knowledge's sake, it's often hard to show what the benefits are. But I can say that so much of the breakthroughs that have come in scientific discovery have come through from serendipity. They've come from pieces of information that were discovered in basic research and that sat for a while until the right opportunity for that application. Uh, there's almost no disease for which we have currently have a cure that was found by looking for the cure. They almost all came by accident and serendipity. If you don't do fundamental basic research, that entire element disappears. It's hard to justify doing that kind of research because you can't say this is what it's going to do. All you can do is do good fundamental science, gain the knowledge, provide the knowledge base, and then that knowledge is there when it's needed. Thank you. Uh, I didn't have a question on the side first. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the complexity and the interconnectedness you brought out of all sorts of levels. Is there no hope, though, for further development in alternative approaches to the kinds of research 
have to be done, I think, that most of us would probably feel, around cell and tissue work. I mean, are there no developments there that you should consider? Now that you might want to answer that. <laughs> the, 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 just there, are there that? new developments around tissue culture work that would remove the problems I, I that you faced? Practice. No, the answer is no. Because, you know, tissue culture just isn't complex enough to mimic a, a living body. I think one of the things I mean, if tissue culture has, of course, uh, cut back on animal research hugely. There's no doubt about it, uh, you know. And uh, not just because of the animals, but it's quicker, it's cheaper, it's, uh, you don't need a lot of infrastructure, and you can do an awful lot of, get a lot of answers from tissue culture that you can't get, that, uh, where you don't need animals, but when it comes to the applied science, you know, tissue culture is wonderful for basic research and figuring out how cells live, how they grow, how uh, DNA functions, whatever. But if you want to say, will this cure a disease, you need a body. And you, again, you know, if you have people who agree to act as subjects, that's fine. But uh, any exper <coughs> invasive experiments <coughs> sorry, uh, on humans <coughs> practically invariably are preceded by the use of animals. For example, drug testing. There are, there are, there are lots of, of uh, assays going on trying new anti-cancer drugs on humans people who are in their last stages of disease and for whom there's no other treatment, they will in many institutions volunteer to have a new drug trust, uh, tried on them. But before that is done, animals were used to determine what is the right dosage, what are the toxic effects. Is it absorbed? Can it be given by mouth or not? All this is done in animals, and then it's taken to humans. And whether that is right or wrong, I don't know. Thank you, Nelly. Do any of you have a comment? Actually, I have a couple of uh, practical examples that may give you hope. So the first ones come from uh, uh, um, embryonic stem cell technology, and there has been huge advances in that field that allow now uh, to take a cell from anybody in the audience here and turn it without any ethically uh, uh, disputable process into an embryonic stem cell-like cell. Embryonic stem cells, you may have all know by now, that are cells that have the power of making any other cell types. So then, let's say you have a patient that has a heart disease. This has been done. It's a real example. You can take a cell from that patient you can turn it into an embryonic-like stem cells, and then you can make heart cells from those. Then you can arrange those heart cells into little mounds in a tissue culture plate, plug electrodes into them, and you can record an electrocardiogram that looks almost identical to the one you record on the patient. And then you can test drugs on each one of these little mounds of cells, and you will ha see the effect of the drugs in the electrocardiogram exactly as if you were testing it on an animal. So this, as you can imagine, is going to revolutionize animal research for certain drug testing. Toxicity. You can take the same cells, and instead of turning them into heart cells, you now turn them into hepatocytes, liver cells. Most of toxicity is acts at the level of the liver, not all. But if you can get rid of those drugs, you'd have a lot less to test, right? So you can do that these days. And these are all developments of the last five years. So there is a lot of hope. I am very optimistic. You know, the problem I was mentioning before, that every cell is, is different even though they look the same to us. Well, now we start having technologies at the beginning, but very clearly there, where we can measure thousands of thousands of parameters in each individual cell. 
right? Once we have that, I don't know about the computing because I'm not a computer, you know, an information technologist, but once we have that, presumably we'll have a much better shot of creating a computer model that mimics a complex situation like an animal. I don't know if it's possible when, as I said, I don't know if I'll be alive, but it will happen. I am very convinced that, you know, this is a transient phase and that we will get over it. A bit like we don't need animals anymore to survive and we used to, right? We, at some point, we won't need animals to find new drugs. Um, now, well, this leads to a terrible question. If we don't need, exper you know, people always say if we don't use experimental animals, they will be able to live a happy life. The moment we don't use experimental animals, they will be extinct because they are bred specifically for research. They are not wild mice that are caught and would otherwise live in the forest. They would be gone. Um, which is not what research, research. Just go to right there. Yeah. My name is Anne Bergmussel, and I'm with Stock ABC Animal Research. Uh, the FDA's own figures indicate that 92% of all bugs that pass the animal testing phase fail in the human trials. And of the 8% that pass the human trials, 4% were eventually withdrawn. So what I'm saying is that we, we have the technology now, we have the ability now to, to you know, work with, as Fabio said, this exciting new technology. We don't need to test on animals. We're actually delaying progress. We, the polio vaccine was delayed for many, many years, for decades, because they were using the wrong delivery system and were trying to deliver it to up the monkey's nose. Um, and as for this lady with the Parkinson's disease, I urgently feel we have to stop trying to develop new models of Parkinson's disease. We can take tissue from Parkinson's sufferers, post-mortem studies. What we're doing is to spending so much of our resources and our energy in developing new models, new models of cancer, new models of Parkinson's. My sister has rheumatoid arthritis. Crushing the joints of an animal does not simulate the disease that she has. We're not finding cures because we're using the wrong models. We should be focusing on the human being. But there is a cure for rheumatoid arthritis, right? Yes, TNF, uh, TNF inhibition is extremely expensive and the government won't pass it to everybody, which is another huge ethical issue that we can discuss now. But that was found in animal. And it doesn't get rid of the disease, but it gets rid of the symptoms fairly efficiently. It's been a huge success. And it's only about, you know, seven or eight years old. So, you know, I want to just make sure you understand that when I said I have hope, I also said I don't know if I'll be alive when it happens. We are not there yet. It is there now. We have the no, no, it's not. No, we don't. If you, see, if you say it's there now, please quote your sources and tell me where I can find it, because I'll use it tomorrow. Go to the Americans for Modern Medical Advancement, the Modern Modernization Committee. Uh, deep brain stimulation is the only really effective therapy we have for Parkinson's disease. That was developed by a clinician. That didn't come from animal research. Yes, it did. Yeah. Can we just, sorry, I just it was take the moderators right again. Sorry, if I'll end up sorry. Yet. Um, the, the maybe just if one of the other panelists wants to respond to this issue, I, I hear what you're saying is that there are we're not we're not at the nirvana, but there are techniques which could be better applied, and there's always the challenge of where to invest the resource. Do we invest it in clinical type research? Do we invest it in animal based research? And you're looking for an answer to where how we could better draw the lines there, I think. It's part no, of the I'm answer. Saying, let's stop animal research in its tracks now because we have the technology, we have the, the, the uh, wonderful scanning equipment, we have amazing technology at our fingertips. If we just investigate that, do the innovative technology, and, and UBC could be a world leader. Instead of plodding along in the dark ages of scientific research, we could be at the forefront using new, new technology, using Going back to the old post postmortem studies that gave us so much information. Thank you very much. Do either of you have any other responses to that? There was no real question there, but just a bunch of statements. No, I was asking why we're spending so much of our resources on trying to develop new models of disease. In because we don't agree with you. We're not there yet. We don't have the alternatives that you Quite claim simple. we have, quite honestly. And, we and wish we were, but we're we, not. 
we heard it many times, but unfortunately, this is pure disinformation. It's just not there. You know, give it to me, I'll use it. But you, you, all you do is you quote a propaganda website. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry, I'll, I'll just, I, I want to hear from other questioners, and there's still some hands up in the audience. And I think you were first in the black sweater there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, I'm not sure if you guys are going to be able to answer this question for me, but a couple times tonight, some of the words animal and life have been interchanged. And where there must be a um, sort of rational argument against it, I, I'm not aware of it, I'd, I'd love to understand it. The question of why humans and animal lives, or how do we equate human life to be better, how can this argument be made against life in general, and, and insect life, or plant life, or bacteria life as well? Is there a, a counter argument to that, that our animal life is worth more than the insects we hit in our car, and bacteria that we clean off our hands and stuff? Like these are, I, maybe I'm just not properly educated on the definition of life, but because it seems like animal life is more important than other life. Anybody want to take a stab on that? I'm sure an animal life is more important to another animal. We are just, it so happens that we are bigger and stronger and we win, which isn't good, I'm not saying, but that's, that's the way it is. I guess the answer that I would give you is, the answer is that ecosystems function as systems. All life within that system is important. You remove any component of it and you've got a problem. So that all life, whether it's insect, amphibian, reptile, fish, bird, mammal, is important and the plant life that goes with it. Yeah, you you dis disrupt any component and you create serious problems. Yeah, I guess my lack of understanding is if we can argue about that we shouldn't test on, on other animals, but still even our existence here, it's, 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 we can say that we're at a point in society where we don't need animals, we don't need to eat animals, we can eat plants, but, but why, why should we eat plants and why are we ethically justified killing any life for us to survive, right? Just, I, I'm not sure where you draw that line, which I think is probably a problem. Thank you, you for your question. more plants eating animals than you do eat Sorry, guys. Uh, I'll just, I'll, you know, I'll ask you to direct your comments to me if you can. There was a question, sorry, there was a question right here in front. This is kind of ready for where we're at right That's now. That's okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, so thank you guys for your speeches. They were really interesting. Um, so my question was regarding one of the subtopics that, that you were describing, um, the subtopic, subtopic of culture and industry. I would just like to have a comment on the industry component of the uh, industry. industry component industry. of uh -huh. or what degree of control the medical industry have, has. Um, research. I don't, I don't so how much control does the medical yeah. industry have on research? I, I didn't comment on the industry because I have no facts. I really didn't look into it and, you know, I, I don't want to comment on something I don't know anything about. Do you, do you want to comment on that? I can give you a short comment that has to do with, uh, and I hope there is no, nobody from industry in the <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so what happened in the last perhaps 15 years is uh, at the beginning of these 15 years, industry um, built huge research program that were very focused on finding, you know, the blockbuster drug. Now about, uh, I would say, five, maybe more years ago, they realized that the success rate of their directed research program was abysmally low compared to the success rate of the serendipitous research programs that go in academia. And so, uh, industry step back their research. They, they, do, they don't do all that much discovery research anymore. And in fact, they just don't dare trying to direct it anymore because every time they did, it just didn't work. And they kind of leave us alone, and they just sit on the sideline watching what we do. And then when they see something interesting, they jump in, and then they start taking it over. And <laughs> at the same time, if they don't take it over, it will never be distributed to the, to the greater population. So, you know, it plays a role. And luckily, it's not a direction uh, imparting role anymore. Or it never really was, in fact. They failed at that. Uh, take one for somebody who hasn't had one before the brown sweater. Yeah. Um, I, I know there's a lot of people at either end of the spectrum of saying, no, we should never use animals ever. There's a lot of people who say, yes, let's use all animals all the time. I know most of you in, and the panel is somewhere in the middle. So I'm curious in terms of animal testing 
animal research, using those terms interchangeably, if there's a point where you say there's some things that are unethical, um, so it, say in terms of, for example, cosmetic research, um, are, as biologists and researchers, where do you draw the line? So it's a good question. I will make a careful distinction between animal research and animal testing. Um, they are, at least as defined, they are different. They're not the same thing. And if so, answering the question depends on which one we're focusing on. But in both cases, there have to be lines and they have to be drawn. And I think the real question is who draws those lines and who decides where it is. And I think ultimately the answer is going to be a democratic society, and that is going to come up with one of the next workshops. But, uh, but yes, there must be lines. And, and I think where the real debate is going to be over, I, I think it was in Brian's comment earlier, but, or I can't, well, we've been going for long enough now, I can't remember where the comment came from, but it, it really comes back to the extent to which the um, research endeavor and all of the rules and regulations and the guidelines are set by the practitioners or are set from the outside. And that is a whole night's worth of debate on its own. So just, can I address the cosmetics issue? Because this is actually a very interesting situation that's going on at UBC. And, uh, you know, I'm not really allowed to talk too much about what goes on at the Animal Care Committee, but in my opinion, my personal opinion, <laughs> there is never going to be a cosmetics testing uh, research protocol approved at UBC with the current committee in place. There is no policy that says UBC will never do it, but I don't think that with the committee composition we have right now, we, we will never agree to the fact that the testing cosmetics on animal is ethical. Or testing a bit Then, sort. you know, 10 years from now, the committee changes, things change, so don't take this as a, a final answer, but just to give you an idea, that, that line is drawn by the Animal Care Committee. One question in front. Yeah, so this has to do with the Animal Care Committee, then where do we draw the line, say, with... Um, you know, making humans take responsibility for their actions. Does our animal care committee allow um, experiments to be done, say, on the effects of smoking? This is an extremely interesting question. Yeah. Let, me, let me widen it. It's not just smoking, right? Let, it's lifestyle. So there are lifestyles that will lead to disease. We know that. They go from overeating sugar, smoking cigarettes, sitting all your life in front of the TV, never doing exercises. Now, we can't quite say, well, you're going to get a heart stroke for sure if you do that. But we can say you have a much increased frequency of stroke in that population. right? And this is a question we have struggled ethically. And uh, um, essentially, the point boils down to this. With all our education uh, efforts, which haven't been enough, but they are, they are ongoing, for, uh, um, aimed at preventing this type of behaviors, we still have a significant portion of the population that does it. Mm -hmm. And the question is, 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 it, is it ethical to abandon them because they misbehave? And what do you think? Well, I think it's not. I think that there is no way that you will stop everybody from having self-destructive behavior, and I don't think it's right to tell these people, well, you want the bicycle, now push the pedals, and suffer in your disease. I don't think it's right. I think we have an obligation to find a cure for the diseases anyway, especially because the, the distinction is not perfect. So the, not just smokers get lung cancers, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, the effect of smokes smoke are very clear and we would not uh, allow a protocol that just replicates the same stuff that we already know to go on because that would be completely scientifically unjustified on top of ethically questionable. But you have to keep in mind that, you know, as we said, not just smokers get cancers. Any last burning comments from either of the other panelists? Bernie's maybe the wrong way to end off on that question. <laughs> I guess the, the one comment that I'll make to finish off on is that at the end of the day, the two ends of the spectrum, from those that are completely opposed to all animal research and would like to see it stopped completely, to those that are the strongest advocates for it, 
The goals that they're after are the same one, and that's for healthy individuals living harmoniously with nature. The difference is how we get there. One group feels it's through knowledge, and one group feels it's through leaving everything well enough alone. What we disagree on is the process, not the goal. And that's where we've got to work together to come up with a process that hopefully everybody can agree with. We may never achieve that, but we can try. Professor Osberg, last comment from you? Yeah, I, I have one, and that is I don't think we can solve it. The question of do we sacrifice and inflict pain on innocent animals because it will help somebody, hopefully. And the answer, of course, is yes, we do it, but it's a bad thing to do, but we do it anyway, and I think it's just part of uh, trying to improve the life of humans and animals, and we'll probably continue doing it. And I don't think medical research is unique that way because, for example, governments that declare war, let's say it's an honest war, not just for oil or whatever, knowingly send lots and lots of innocent young people to die. And they will, and it's done. And we agree with it. We elect those governments, and they do it for the greater good. And I don't think any president or king or whatever enjoys it, but they do it anyway because they feel that in the big picture they are doing something positive. And that's the way I feel if I use animals. I don't like it at all. I feel very badly about it, but I do it because I think that it is good for humanity, animals, whatever you want to call it. And it's an insoluble problem. I don't think we'll ever say it's good to use animals, but we'll do it anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, panelists, also for, for, for leaving us on the note of governance because uh, this will be a topic coming up in our next lecture, which is scheduled for March the 7th, and I invite you all back for that. There will also be the plenary lecture of the series. Franz Wall is going to be presenting on empathy in animals. That will be on March the 8th at the Frederick Wood Theatre, and the final of the series will be March 29th. I'd like to end by thanking the audience for a wonderful discussion. Uh, I thought all the right questions came up. And I also ask the audience to join me in thanking our panelists for...